Hi, I'm Brad Neal, and let's talk some Chem 150. So we've talked about in lecture up to this point that light has some interesting properties, waves and particle-like properties. We've also now talked about, via the de Broglie equation, that electrons have interesting properties in that they are particles that have wave-like properties, or are they waves that have particle-like properties. Electrons have interesting properties that are both particle and wave-like. So now we're at the point in time, it's, start, it's time to start talking about the structure of an atom. What are atoms actually looking like? What are they? Okay, so let's go over to the slides here for a second. To help us explain the structure of an atom, we're going to look specifically at hydrogen, and that's because hydrogen is, is our simplest atom. It's just one proton and one electron, and that's it. It's not super difficult, comparatively speaking. By nature, hydrogen is diatomic, but for this example, we're just going to be looking at a single hydrogen. That's the theory anyways, for this simulation that we're gonna walk through together. Um, again, this is coming to us from FET, which you can find the link here. Um, they do amazing simulations. Can't say enough positive things about FET. So, what I've got going now is this experiment. Um, so let's walk through it. Up here at the top, we have just this little dial that's telling us what's actually happening. And then we have this model uh, predictor that we're going to eventually toggle. So we've got our light controls, and right now we're just shining white light. White light are, is a combination of all of the different kinds of wavelengths, which we can think of as being individual photons. And that's what we're seeing floating through space here. <clears throat> it is hitting this box of hydrogen, hydrogen gas. We're thinking about this being atomic hydrogen. And this little like subset here, this little thing, is this breakout like, hey, what's happening here? The question mark is hydrogen. And we've got this question mark here because we don't actually have a great idea of what hydrogen looks like. Yeah, we talked about in chapter two, the Rutherford model. But for right now, humor me, we don't have a great idea of what's happening. Now, I'm going to go away for a second. And hopefully what you can see now is where I was, we have this spectrometer. And so what it's doing is it is measuring the photons that are getting bounced out as part of this experiment. The spectrophotometer is saying like, no, I'm not gonna count all the stuff that is flying by the hydrogen atom. I'm gonna be observing anything that comes from the hydrogen itself. What's that mean? Okay, we're gonna get into that. Oh, you see that little red photon floating away? That And here's a nice little teal one floating away. That's coming from, oh, there's like a little ultraviolet one floating away. That's coming from the hydrogen atom itself. And the spectrophotometer is recording that. And I've let this thing go for a long time now. And what we can see are, there are just a few discrete lines. So it's not like all red is being emitted by the spectrophotometer. It's only red at this one particular wavelength. And that teal that we saw fly away earlier, it's teal that's coming from this one particular wavelength. And there's a blue and there's a purple and then there's this ultraviolet stuff. Hey, look, another red going floating by. So each one of these dots is just a count of how many photons are being emitted from the hydrogen. So this is what we see happen when we bombard hydrogen with energy, uh, radiation. We see that we have specific wavelengths of photons that get emitted from the hydrogen. It's up to us now, and I'm gonna come back, it's up to us now to discuss and try to figure out a model that helps us explain the observation that we're seeing. 
So let's go into prediction mode. Okay. So what we now have is over here on the left is this model simulator. And from this model simulator, we're going to go from a classical definition of the atom all the way down to the quantum Schrodinger model of the equation. So if the atom is a ping pong ball, then what we're going to be seeing is that any light that hits the ping pong ball, any light that's hitting the ping pong ball gets reflected. Oh, did you see that orange go floating away? That orange photon there gets reflected by our ping pong ball. Well, guess what we didn't see in our spectrometer? We didn't see green, we didn't see orange, we didn't see all those colors. We only saw certain ones. So this ping pong ball or this billiard ball model of what the atom is doesn't actually represent very well reality. So this model is not very good. It's time to come up with a more complicated version. Back in chapter two, we talked about the plum pudding model of the atom. Now the plum pudding said, oh, we've got this like nebula space that has got this positive charge and inside it we have the electron. And so the electron is floating around in this space. Um, and this is kind of nice because it takes into consideration that we actually have electrons, but this is not the most advanced model because we know by the Rutherford experiments that we've got this nucleus in the center. So this ain't a great model. So let's go on to something that looks like the solar system. Okay, now oh, this is really fun for me. If we have an electron and it's circling around our proton, it explodes. Let's do that again, that was a good time. And it's circling around, it's circling around, it's getting closer, closer, kaboom. Wait, what's going on? Well, the electron is a negatively charged particle. The proton is a positively charged particle. If you ever held two ends of a magnet next to one another, they try to come together. That's kind of the same thing that happens with columbic interactions. We've talked about columbic interactions in class. Opposite charges attract one another. Um, and so these protons and these electrons would attract one another and kapowie. They're going to come in contact and explode. So we need something that's more complicated than just an electron floating around like in a classical solar system model. So this is where the Bohr model of the atom is going to come into play. Now we have the electron floating around and it looks like the electrons are floating around in these like orbit like things, right? A key thing that we need to consider here is though the electron isn't just floating and just staying in space uh, by like not moving. Mm, it's spinning, folks. That's the key thing here. Because of the spin, it's allowing the electron to not crash into the nucleus. And so I'm going to now turn on the energy diagram and I'm going to go away for a second. This is our energy diagram over here to the right. Now here at the very bottom, we have what is called n equals one. And this is corresponding to this innermost circle here on our diagram. And look, our electron now just jumped out to n equals four. That's a higher energy orbit, if you will, around the nucleus. Now these orbits, if you will, are very discreetly spaced, right? We're not gonna have the electron able to float in spaces in that aren't within the dotted lines here. So the energy of the electron has to go to these various discrete sp spots. The electron can only exist in these discrete distances from the proton. Well, how does that help anything? Hopefully you're checking down here and our spectrometer. Our spectrometer is starting to register counts of radiation that's well, coming, being ejected from our hydrogen um, as a function of 
the electron, and let's see, maybe, we, oh, yep, see, it jumped up here to energy level three, and then when it's going to drop down, it dropped down to energy levels two, and if you saw that, there was a nice little red squiggle, and that would correspond to a red dot here in our spectrophotometer. That is the red dot that we saw in our experiment. Okay, we just jumped up to n equals three, and hey, we dropped down to n equals two, and we've got another red dot, and that red photon was floating away. So this model is nicely predicting what we're observing. So the, what are the key things here? And I'm gonna speed this up just so we get some more counts on our spectrophotometer. Wow, that is fast. Look at all those electron photon interactions just happen up and down, up and down, up and down. Doom, doom, doom. All right. Um, oh, we even got ourselves a nice little purple one here. It's just like one single purple dot here. Fantastic. All right, so let's slow that down and I'm gonna come back. Okay, so what does any of this actually mean? First off, we have discrete air orbits that the electron can travel in. It takes energy hitting the electron. See, that little ultraviolet photon kicked the electron way out here and then the energy I'm sorry, then the electron dropped to a lower energy, and when it drops to a lower energy, it itself emits off a photon of light. Okay, the electron just absorbed another photon. It's way out here. When it drops, it dropped down to n equals 3, and then it dropped to n equals 1, and when it does that drop, it can emit a photon of light. And that's what our spectrometer, I'm sorry, yeah, our spec spectrometer is picking up. It's picking up the photons of light that are emitted as the electron is dropping from a higher energy to a lower energy state. And see, yeah, it just dropped, and this little photon that's floating off this diagonal, that was caused by the electron dropping from an energy state up to an energy state lower. So, requires you to have energy to excite the electron, but it's not just any energy. It's gotta be the energy necessary for the electron to jump to one of those exact levels. So not any old energy will do. It's gotta be the exact right amount of energy. Think about how we did that with the energy required to eject an electron off of a metal surface, right? There was a certain amount of energy and it caused the electron to get ejected off the metal surface. Here, there's a certain amount of energy that's required to get the electron to jump from one level up to the next. When the electron is at a higher energy level, it has an option of coming down in energy and releasing the excess energy that it has to get back to that lowest energy, the ground state energy, ground state, the ground state, n equals one. It has the ability to eject a photon in the amount of energy necessary for that electron to drop in energy. And it doesn't have to go down to from n equals 6 to n equals 1. It can go up to n equals 6, and it can drop down to 5, then 4, then 3, then 2, then 1. Or it can go up to 6 and down to 2. It can go up and down as it is interacting with incident photons hitting it. And it can go up, that is, and then drop based on how much energy it is releasing. <clears throat> so this is going to be our basics of the Bohr model of the atom. So this Bohr model of the atom very nicely is predicting, I'm going to go away for a second, it's very much nicely predicting what we're actually observing in real life. Because this down here at the bottom looks very much like what we were actually predicting. <clears throat> the Bohr model is this nice little thing. It explains what we observe. Here's a bunch of information about it. This equation that you're seeing here on the screen now, this is gonna be the quantification of, excuse me, the energy that it's going to take for a certain energy level. So let's talk through the parts. So E is the energy, this, this, Z, 
is what our nuclear charge is. So that's really the count of how many protons you've got. In the case of hydrogen, it's really nice because hydrogen has one proton. So it's going to be one for Z. For something like helium, because we're going to have two protons, Z would then equal two. So on, so on, so forth, so forth. N is the level of the orbit. Now, the bigger the N, the bigger the orbit. N equals one is as low as we go. We can't have N equals zero. N has to equal one or greater, but it's always got to equal a whole number. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, etc. You can't have partial numbers. Partial numbers would be in that space between the orbits, which we showed you on the simulation, and the electron can't exist there. For naming, n equals 1 is going to be considered our ground state, and that's the lowest energy state of our electron. So we can use that previous equation to figure out things like this. We could determine what wavelength of light is emitted when an electron trans transitions from n equals 5 to n equals 3. All we have to do is have this equation. So how do we do this? It's nice. One, we have to know what kind of atom we're working with. Nine times out of 10 in general chemistry 150, you're going to be dealing with hydrogen. So that means your nuclear charge, Z, is going to be equal to one. And one squared in most states is equal to one. So we're going to end up with this numeric value here times one squared, so one, divided by n squared. This is where we're going to need to keep track of, like what the problem gives us, what our value of n is. So we can figure out the energy of an orbit of n equals 5 by plugging in 5 into this equation. That's going to give us our energy at n equals 5. Fantastic. What about n equals 3? What's the energy of that? Well, just use that same equation. You just now use n equaling 3 in the equation. So now we have energy of n equals 5. We have energy of n equals 3. Take the difference between those two. Energy n equals 5 minus energy when n equals 3. Bada bing, bada bang, bada boom. You get an energy out. And then you're like, well, it asked me for a wavelength. And then I say unto you, yes. But in previous videos, we talked about how you can take the energy of a photon and you can convert that into wavelength. The punchline is E equals h nu right? Or E equals HC over lambda. So this becomes kind of a plug and chug scenario. The first plug and chug is the equation that we see over nah, plugging in the right nuclear charge for the atom that you're working with, and then plugging in the right orbit to figure out the energy. We could do this the opposite way. We could say, how much energy does it take to go from n equals 3 to n equals 5? Then we're just going to need to reverse those energy or those values of energy. It's going to change the sign. Yeah, that's right. It's going to change the numeric sign on this. And that's totally cool because just like with our thermochemistry chapter, the sign is going to give us an indication of whether energy is being released or gained by our system. Oh man, it all comes back together, doesn't it? So this is the basics of the Bohr model of the atom. A couple downsides of the Bohr model of the atom. It's only going to work for one electron systems. Once you put multi-electrons, multi-electron systems like something like helium, now we have two protons, two neutrons, but most specific, more specifically, we have two electrons. The Bohr model and this equation that we had here is not going to work if you have a multi-electron system. Two electrons, this equation goes out the window. So this equation only works for one electron systems, and the most prevalent one electron system that we're going to deal with is hydrogen. Why does it not work? Well, you see, electrons are negatively charged particles. That means that they repel one another, columbic interactions and all. So electron-electron repulsions cause the Bohr model to break down. So we're going to have to come up with a better model for things that are more complicated than hydrogen. 
which is just about everything on the periodic table. And so that is when we're going to come into play with the wave-like properties of an electron, and they're going to be so important to help us detangle this. But until we get to that part, I hope that this has been helpful, and please let me know if you have questions or comments. Uh, either email me, text me, or um, do that jazz and leave something in the comments below. Thank you very much.